Okay, I guess we can start. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce our today's speaker, Professor Volker Mehrmann, to you from the Technical University in Berlin. Um, I will take a few minutes to introduce uh, him to you, but this will for sure not be comprehensive because if I would do it comprehensive or in a comprehensive way, then uh, Volker would not have any time uh, anymore to speak. So maybe just very roughly, um, in 79, he got his uh, diploma and his teacher's exam in mathematics and physics. 82, his PhD, and 88, uh, he finished his habilitation, also in mathematics. All these things took place at the University of Bielefeld. And after his PhD, there were very many visits somewhere else, for instance, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, at the IBM Scientific Center in Heidelberg, at the RWTH in Aachen. And uh, then he moved in 93 for seven years to the Technical University in Chemnitz. And since uh, the year 2000, he is a pro full professor at the Department of Mathematics and Natural Sciences at the Technical University in Berlin, where he still uh, works. And uh, yeah, so he also had and has a lot of additional positions. For instance, he uh, was the vice chair um, of the DFG Research Center Matheon and also later the chair and uh, more or less the same with the Einstein Center, uh, where he served as a vice chair and chair. He won many prizes and honors, like uh, since from 2011 on, he is elected uh, SIAM Fellow. He got an ERC Advanced Grant uh, from 2011 to 2016. During the same time, he was Vice President and President of the GAM. And since 2019, I guess, he is, serves also as the President of the European Mathematical Society. His research interests are numerical mathematics, metrics and operator theory, and control theory. And uh, since a few years, I would say that he's also serving as the main ambassador for Port Hamiltonian modeling in applied uh, mathematics. And I guess that this is also uh, the topic of the talk. You can all read the title. And with this, Volker, I'm happy to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to Trier. It's a great pleasure to be here. I would rather be there, like to be there in, in person, uh, but uh, that's the way it is nowadays. So I have thought the long. Volker, I cannot hear you. Anymore. Anymore. In the beginning, I heard you, but now. Yeah. Yeah. Is this better now? Better now? Yes, sir. yes now we yep. can hear you. Yep. Okay. So um, I thought a long time which of the many topics uh, I, that have to do with energy based modeling, simulation, control, and optimization uh, I should uh, discuss here. And I've decided to talk about one which is not related to Trier and, and uh, the previous work with some of the people here but uh, to do uh, to talk a little bit about a real industry uh, application and um, so this is a hierarchical energy-based modeling and uh, i would like to first tell you a little bit what this is about so first of some general remarks uh, as Martin said, I feel myself an ambassador of uh, modeling simulation and optimization and control. And so most modern key technologies require uh, these mathematical fields and in particular of complex or difficult dynamical systems. And most real world systems are multi-physics systems. That means they combine components from different physical domains and with different accuracies and uh, different scales. 
if you look into the <laughs> modeling software, this becomes exceedingly automatized. You, you build systems as networks from subsystems. And in the near future, I think a topic that we will all uh, be dealing with as mathematicians, as applied mathematicians, will, I think, be digital twins. What is a digital twin? That's a virtual model of a real world project or a product or pro, uh, process. And I personally think that modeling, analysis, numerics, control, optimization, data science techniques, they should go hand in hand. They cannot be done anymore, each of them separately. And also a topic that is very dear to my heart is model reduction. And I know there's a group, a lot of people in TRIA that work on this and uh, this also is needed. Okay, so with these general topics in mind. So let me start with a real world from industry. So some years ago, I started to work with some colleagues from mechanical engineering on a high tech project, namely, namely a disc brake squeal. So you all know that sometimes cars make funny noises. It's actually much more frequent in trains uh, when they go uh, around the curve or some of you may be mountain bikers and those guys when they go down the hill then and break then they the brakes makes funny noises but this was dealing with cars and um, it's an important uh, problem for customer satisfaction and for the people who live nearby where these people cars are driving but not so much a safety risk and it's a nonlinear effect and it's extremely hard to detect. And as usually nonlinear effects, it happens exactly when you don't want it to happen and it doesn't happen when you want to show it to somebody. And the car industry is trying for decades um, to uh, improve this by changing the designs of brake and disc. And uh, the question is, can modeling simulation and uh, optimization help in this? So we had a project uh, with several car manufacturers and a finite element company. And this was supported by the Ministry of Economics via the so-called AIF Foundation. And for the theoretical part, uh, it was uh, a DFG project in the priority program, Calm, Smooth and Smart uh, with Norbert Hoffmann from TU Hamburg and uh, Utz von Wagner from uh, TU Berlin. And so the goal was to develop a model of a brake system with all the effects that may cause squeal. So this is friction, circulatory, gyroscopic effects. And to simulate the brake behavior for many different parameters, disk speed, material, geometry parameters, and in particular, analyze the stability of the system, and I will come to this. And then when it does make uh, strange noises to design, uh, to ch change the design, or increase damping via so-called shims. And I will show you a little bit more about that later on as well. So how does it, such a disc break look like? So on the left here, you have a finite element model. You probably cannot see this, but if, you would, I, if I would zoom in, you can see uh, uh, millions of uh, finite elements um, in this break. This is an industrial finite element model. And the brake pad, this is where the brakes are clamped together. And then the friction between the brake pad and the brake um, creates a that what you want in a brake that, that the car stops, but it also creates in certain positions a vibration. And if this leads to a resonance, then uh, we, we would have a squeal. So let's look how, how one models such a system. So typically this is done um, as a finite element model hierarchy of a parametric differential algebraic finite element system. So you have mass times Q double dot. Q is the vector of finite element coefficients describing the displacements. 
then you have three matrices in front of the velocity, C1, CR, and CG, and there are already some parameters here. And then there is, so this could be viewed as a generalized damping matrix and a, a generalized stiffness matrix. And you have a forcing term, which comes from the breaking. So the matrix M is positive, semi-definite, and symmetric, and it's actually singular. Uh, the matrix C1 is symmetric, and it's semi-definite, and it's describing material damping. CG is skew-symmetric, it describes gyroscopic effects. CR is symmetric, that's friction-induced damping here. Um, and I should say this right here, while most of the parts could be generated from a finite element discretization of a partial differential equation, this matrix CR here, that is created from data. So it's created from measurement because friction is something which is extremely difficult to model. And that's why um, here we have a data uh, constructed part of the model. And then we have a symmetric stiffness matrix K1, a non-symmetric matrix KR describing the circulatory effects and this uh, KG is a, a geometric stiffness matrix. And then there is the rotational speed of disk with respect to a reference velocity WR. And you can see there's one over omega, omega and omega squared here. So you could ask the question, why is this rational and has one over omega and omega squared? Well, this is because the ansatz for the data fitting was based on such a, a rational function. It could well be cubic or exponential in omega, whatever ansatz function you make to generate this model. This is really a hierarchy and a mixture of models. So there's a finite element hierarchy, so the grid hierarchy uh, and the type of ansatz functions. Um, so different components and domains of these parts here are modeled differently. This disk is rotating, so that, that's a different type of model than the part that where the brake is linked to the chassis. And in particular, this part here on the brake pad we will talk about later as well. What are the challenges? Well, this is a finite element model. It was originally nonlinear friction was there and it was a, approximated by, by some model uh, in a rather crude way. So, and then some other nonlinearities were linearized. Some small parameters were ex uh, expanded in an um, asymptotic expansion. <clears throat> then I mentioned already, we don't have a PDE really in the background. And if you would let the step size go to zero, this would not converge to a reasonable model. So question is what are error? How do we get error estimates or adaptivity? And for the optimization and control, we need a reduced model. And we also need an efficient method to compute and optimize so-called Lyapunov exponents or stability exponents. Uh, for many parameter values. And for this, we have to solve a parametric eigenvalue problem. So in principle, in this model, all the bad things that you can uh, envision in an industrial problem are involved. So what is typically done in order to figure out uh, whether this thing will, will squeal is you do a so-called linear stability analysis or linear eigenvalue analysis. So you make an ansatz Q of T is E of lambda of omega T times V of omega. And that gives you a quadratic eigenvalue problem. So you have lambda squared M plus lambda times C plus K times the uh, eigenvector V and everything depends on the parameter. This is a quadratic eigenvalue problem. You can go to first order formulation. Then you get such a complicated parameter dependent uh, uh, linear eigenvalue problem, generalized eigenvalue problem. And the likelihood of a break to squeal is highly correlated 
with the magnitude of the positive real part of an eigenvalue. So if you have large positive real parts, I think yeah, I should do it this way, um, large positive real parts, then um, you will have squeal. Whether you will hear it will depend on the imaginary part. If the imaginary part is high enough, you will not hear it. Maybe your dog will hear it, but uh, so you try to push it out of the frequency range that you would like to hear. And um, experiments indicate the nonlinear behavior, and this, uh, it, you can show that this is a non subcritical hop bifurcation which is taking place there. And now let me try. I've never tried this. Whether this works via Zoom, I will try to show you a movie. If I find my window here. So my colleagues from mechanical engineering made a movie. So on the left, you see the disc break of a real break. And I started and I hope uh, the noise will not be too, anno too annoying. Is it too loud? No. So because this is the speed of the brake that is going on. At a certain at a certain speed, you 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 hear the squeal, and then you if you bring the brake squeal uh, the the speed down, and at a certain point it jumps back. Huh. And now comes the interesting thing. Now somebody comes with a screwdriver and hits it. And you can also hit it again with a screwdriver. And I hope this was visible. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, can we deal with such a situation uh, in real life? And can and do this model based. And so in order to do this, let me be a little bit visionary and say, what would I like from a mathematical model? Make a wish list. So we want a representation that I can couple models across different scales and physical domains. We want a representation that is close to the real physical or engineering behavior for open and closed systems, so systems with control or without. Uh, as mathematicians, we would like to have nice algebraic, geometric, and analytical properties. The model should be easy to analyze, existence, uniqueness, robustness, stability, uncertainty, error analysis. Uh, I work a lot in numerical linear algebra. Uh, I would like to have a normal form. I would like to have uh, error control and the model should be good for space discretization, time discretization, and model reduction. And it should be good for simulation, control, optimization, stability analysis. And the question is, is there such a jack of all trades or the nice word Eierling the Wollmilchsau in German? And um, as I said, I could have talked about many other different problems. We, we have been working on such topics for gas transport, for electrical power networks, for district heating networks with the group in Trier, for water networks, for electrical circuits, for multi-body systems, and recently also for uh, thermodynamic and reactive floats. Uh, and uh, the most recent, I always, I leave the slides uh, to, to display, so there is reference here uh, on this. And so, in order to approach this wish list, wish list uh, let me do talk about energy-based modeling. So 
The idea is to use energy or in thermodynamics entropy or as exergy as a common quantity of different systems to connect them as a network via energy transfer. You split the components into energy storage elements. So like a capacitor in an electrical uh, circuit, energy dissipating components, for example, friction models where energy is turned from friction into heat, plus control and inputs and outputs, as well as interconnection. And you combine them via so-called Dirac structure, which is a differential geometric way of describing this. I will not talk about the differential geometric part here, um, but there's a very nice differential geometric uh, framework behind it. And we also will allow every submodel in such a network to be a whole hierarchy of a very coarse models to very fine models. And reduced models could be also, they could be continuous or discrete, and they could be the full or reduced model. And the way to do this in a systematic and system theoretic way are so called Port Hamiltonian systems. And if you uh, want to read more about this, this is about 20 years old. And uh, there's a very nice uh, um, course notes uh, from Ayan Wanderschaft and Diedrich Jelsema from 2014. And for the uh, PDE version of it, a book by Jakob and Zwart from 2012. And there's even a modeling software uh, by Peter Britfeld, uh, which one can directly uh, access. So what is a Port Hamiltonian system? So let me start with the most simple version, the ODE version. So you have an ordinary differential equation. Here you have the rate or uh, the first derivative. You have a Hamiltonian function, which is energy or exergy or uh, entropy, H. And you look here at the gradient with respect to the state X of this Hamiltonian. And then in front of that, you have two coefficients, a coefficient J, which is skew symmetric or skew adjoint and describes the energy flux between the storage elements and the, and the coefficient R, which is symmetric and semi-definite or self-adjoint and coercive and um, describes the energy dissipation or loss in the system. And then you have ports and they are written in a funny way as B minus P here and B plus P transpose here. U is an input to the system and Y is an output to a system. And in some cases you even have a so-called feed through terms, which I've written as a symmetric plus Q symmetric part. So this is an ODE with a special structure. And if you look at it, and when I looked at it the first time I said, yeah, so what? It's, it's pretty general, <laughs> almost everything can be written in this way. And indeed, most physical systems can be written in this way or slight generalizations. So in the infinite dimensional case, these coefficients would be operators that map into appropriate function spaces. So why should this, this be a good approach? So first of all, Port Hamiltonian systems generalize Hamiltonian systems and they are important in physics and also gradient flow systems and or for those of you who know so-called generic systems, which are a mixture between Hamiltonian and gradient flow systems. You don't have conservation of energy anymore as in Hamiltonian systems, but you have a so-called dissipation inequality. That means the ha Hamiltonian, the energy function at time T1 minus that at time T0 is bounded from above by a function which depends on the input and the output y transpose u and note the y has the same dimension as the u here. So the number of inputs and the number of outputs is the same. So you can these take these two functions, build uh, a scalar product with them and integrate them. That's one thing. So you have something like you replace the conservation of energy by dissipation inequality. Second, and this is why they are so powerful in 
uh, in uh, the solution uh, in the in modeling is if you take two pH systems and you interconnect them in a power conserving way so that there are no losses on the interconnection, then uh, it's again a port Hamiltonian system. That means you can build models uh, in a modularized way. Uh, when you write them down in a proper way, port Hamiltonian systems are automatically stable and passive. Passive means that they don't generate energy. They are very nice for Galactic projection and for model reduction. And the physical properties are encoded uh, in the algebraic structure of the coefficients, these sym symmetric and skew symmetric and semi-definite, and in the geometric structure uh, of the flow of the dynamics. And the systems are easily extendable. Uh, we will do a, a slight extension. <laughs> Um, so we would like to add constraints, algebraic constraints, like for example, Kirchhoff's laws in, uh, in networks or position constraints or conservation laws, extra conservation laws. And if you do that, there are slightly different versions of Port Hamiltonian DAEs, differential algebraic equations. And the goal is now to put, to put such systems together so to fulfill as many points on our wish list as possible. And I, there's some recent work uh, that we have done with uh, Christopher Beatty and uh, Hongo Xu and Hans Wart and Paul Van Doren and also with Ricardo Morandin. And uh, also there's work by Wanderschaft and Wanderschaft and Maske uh, looking at from slightly different angles. So what is the extension? Why do we do this a little bit more general? So it looks almost the same as before, but now we have in front of the X dot, we have a matrix here, matrix function here, and that could be even rectangular and depend on T and X. Then we have R here, that's, a vector valued function. Um, and I will sh show you where, why you need this. And then we have the J and the R as before. And that should be a T here, not an R. And now it's not X dot T, uh, X here or the gradient of the Hamiltonian, but an arbitrary function Z. And the rest is the same. Input, output, feed through term. And now, and we have a Hamiltonian as before. And now we require two more conditions. We require that the state derivative, the uh, derivative with respect to the state of the Hamiltonian is E transpose Z. So first that looks pretty awkward, but think about that E is the identity as we had in the ODE case, then we take Z to be the gradient of the Hamiltonian. So that's the extension in that direction. And the time, the partial time derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect uh, to T is Z transpose R. So that is this extra function R here. And if we don't have that function, then the time derivative would be uh, uh, equal to zero. So that is an extra term that we need. And this definition extends to also weak form formulation in PDEs and also to infinite dimension. And if you have this formulation, you get again such a dissipation inequality that the Hamiltonian between two different times is bounded from above by the inner product of input and output. And you get the so-called power balance equation that the total time derivative of the Hamiltonian is given by this term here, which is Z and U, U is the input, and that is this term which is in, uh, in the on the right side, times W. And what was W? W is this matrix here, and that's the matrix R that we have here, and the P and the P transpose and the S. And this is very often called the dissipation matrix. That's the extended dissipation matrix for input 
uh, systems with input. While in the previous case, we only looked at the R, which is for the dynamical system dissipation inequality without the input. So this is an equality. And since the matrix W is positive semi-definite, you have that this total time derivative is less than this Y transpose U. And if you integrate that, you get this dissipation inequality. This structure in, in its full generality is in the full nonlinear setting transformation invariant, which is very important because it allows you to go to different coordinate systems. So consider such a port Hamiltonian DIE and the state space X and an extended state space uh, time interval times state space. And you do a change of variables in time and space, which is a local diffeomorphism. And you can also choose an extra matrix U, capital U, which is continuous and pointwise invertible. And if you do a change of variables by concatenating uh, the, this phi function, multiplying the equations from the left with U transpose and doing the same on the U and the R and the other coefficients, then the resulting system is again port Hamiltonian. So you can really change your coordinate system, which is extremely important. For example, if you want to do finite element methods and want to go to reference um, uh, configuration. And if this phi is even a global diffeomorphism, then the two systems are equivalent. And this extra term R here, why do we have that? That is in order to deal with uh, transformations which are time dependent. So if you wanted to put yourself on a, in a coordinate system which runs with the dynamics, then you need this uh, R. If everything's uh, time constant, you don't need that. An important thing when you do time discretization is that you make the system autonomous. Usually one makes the system autonomous by just adding T dot equals one as an equation. That's the second equation that I've added here. And you just add this to the system and the new system is again Port Hamiltonian. But now it's autonomous. So for, for most time discretization methods, that's what you want. And then you can take two systems like this that are already made autonomous and you connect them the interconnected system. So you can take any combination M times U plus N times Y for the concatenated vector of inputs and concatenated vectors of outputs. So for example, output of one as input of the other would be a typical case, but you can also uh, uh, glue them together in a different way. Then the new system that you get by this gluing, writing them the new state the vector new vector z in this form and the new vector x in this uh, so-called behavioral form is again port Hamiltonian with the two energy functions added. So that means you can connect in many different ways uh, systems together and it will be again port Hamiltonian. There has been also in the last 10 years I would say quite a lot of uh, attempts to do this uh, for the PDE uh, setting. So you could use operator theoretic approaches, differential geometric approaches like gradient flow or generic. You could use formal so-called direct structures, or you could look at structured PDE systems. There's quite a lot of references and I could probably write uh, 500 here, which have done that. Um, I would say the way it is set up in this form directly gives you most of the things that you want also in the PDE setting. But there are some differential geometric terms like Jacobi identities and things like that, where you have to do a little bit of extra work to fit this properly. Okay. We want to apply this to our brake system. And in order to do this, we, we have constant coefficient. They only depend on parameters. So, in the linear constant coefficient case, it looks much, much nicer. So 
we have here the matrix E, then we have J minus R. The, matri the function Z is Q, Q times X. And the extra properties are that this operator QTE DDT minus QTJQ is Q joint. And that was the skew sym symmetry of the J matrix that is encoded here that QTE is ETQ is greater or equal to zero. For those of you who are in, in an optimization, that means that the Hessian of the energy function is positive semidef, symmetric and positive semidefinite. And this was the matrix W, which simplifies uh, as well. And this is only for the case of a quadratic Hamiltonian. Otherwise, you, there's a non, some more nonlinear terms here. So we want to apply this in the break. And the first question is, does that give you anything else than, yes, there are eigenvalues <laughs> or something like that? And the answer is, it's amazingly a lot of linear algebra that you can pull out of the, these structures. So take such a system and look at the uh, pencil P of lambda, which is lambda E minus J minus RQ, which would be uh, the Laplace transform of this leading term here. If you look at that or the linear uh, stability analysis, if you have an eigenvalue, then it's in the left half plane, in the closed left half plane. And if the eigenvalue is not the zero eigenvalue, so it's, and it's purely imaginary, then it's semi-simple. So no, no Jordan blocks. And if you have an eigenvalue on the imaginary axis, then the eigenvector has to be in the kernel of R times Q. So invariant subspace associated with purely imaginary eigenvalues, they have to sit in the kernel of the damping matrix or, or dissipation matrix. The only two eigenvalues which create a little bit of trouble is zero and infinity because the matrix E could be singular so you can have infinite eigenvalues, but they can have sizes of Jordan blocks at most size two. For those of you who know a little bit about differential algebraic equation, that's pretty nice because higher, higher index for differential algebraic equation is, is a lot of problem, uh, trouble. And you can show that the size is at most two. So this structure gives you quite a lot of things. So you get asymptotic stability if it's regular. So the determinant of this is not identically zero. The finite eigenvalues are all in the open left half plane and the system is index one. That means the eigenvalue infinity is sem semi-simple. You get Lyapunov stability if it's regular and zero and infinity are semi-simple. And um, you get robust stability if the distance to instability to the, is, is, um, is large and the distance to the nearest index two problem is large and the distance to the nearest singular problem is large. So an interesting optimization problem is to compute these distances. I will mention that at the end of my talk. So let's apply this to the break squeal problem. So look at our, I, I now dropped the parameter dependence. I look at, look at it and it has such a second order differential equation form M is semi-definite, D is semi-definite, G is skew-symmetric, that's this part, K is symmetric, positive, semi-definite, and N is something, an arbitrary matrix. M is singular, but diagonal typically, at least if you use linear, uh, linear and quadratic finite elements. Uh, so the infinite structure can be easily detected. So singular part of the E matrix. And more difficulties arise if you have different Ansatz functions. And you can show that the Kronecker and Jordan blocks at infinity and zero are of size one. And that the system is robustly regular. So it's nicely away from zero. But we have seen the squeal, eigenvalues cross the imaginary axis. So this cannot be a Port Hamiltonian system. So let's write it in first order. So here's a first order formulation. It looks almost like we have it. So it's E times Z dot, E is mass and stiffness matrix. 
then a skew matrix matrix J, which is this matrix here. The Q is the identity, but we have a perturbation term. And this perturbation term is indefinite. We could pull it in here, but it would lead to an indefinite dissipation matrix. And so this is not a Port Hamiltonian system. And the instability and the squeal arises from this indefinite term. So um, we have this dissipation inequality. So we know that the energy function is bounded from above by this integral. integral. And if this function here is positive, there is some room between less than or equal to zero and less than or equal to something positive. And that's where the instability sits. It sits in this inequality. This can be positive and then there's something in between. And actually this is good because the breaking force can be in, in, um, viewed as a, as a output feedback and the so that makes this term positive and that makes the system unstable. And in a way we want that because without bre breaking force, we don't have breaking. So uh, this is from the physical uh, point of view. This perturbation matrix N that ends in this uh, perturbation block here, uh, that is restricted to the finite element nodes on the pad. So this is actually low rank compared to the big system. Actually, one can write this very simple in, in a so-called behavior approach as we had it before. So I put the variables x, u, and y into one vector. Then this has the structure that we had before, E matrix here and J minus R. And here is a feedback matrix. So U is F times Y and so the feedback matrix in the R, if this is positive semi-definite then, or has a positive eigenvalue, then we have a minus here. And so that means this matrix here is not semi-definite. So the feedback is, you can view it in, in this form. You can immediately see where the instability becomes from. It doesn't have to be uh, unstable, but it can be. So there are some optimization tasks here. For example, maximize the distance to instability by adding more damping to the system or the distance to Jordan blocks of size zero and infinity of size two or the distance and singularity. And you can redesign the break. So that's a uh, geometry optimization problem or you can build a feedback controller that when it starts to squeal uh, it changes, for example, what the guy did with the screwdriver. Um, so to, to, to bring it out of that squeal mode. Uh, this improved damping is done via shims and I will show you in a minute. And um, for all of this, we need model reduction. So here, this is a brake pad and you, you put some multi-layer layer of elastic material uh, on top of this and that sits here on the back of the brake pad. And that creates extra damping in the, in the car. And if you buy yourself a, a, a modern car, they will have these shims. But still the damping may not be enough to, uh, to, uh, to fully remove the squeal. Okay, I mentioned this already. So in order to deal with all this, in particular to optimize the damping and the distances, we need model reduction. So what are the surrogate models? So you place the fine Port Hamiltonian DAE model in the network, in each network node or in the whole network by a surrogate model. You could also do this from input output data. That would be a data driven model. You do not modify the network coupling structure. You balance the equation and constraints. They may have still have, they must still hold. And you make sure that the physics is properly re uh, re uh, reflected. So what is model reduction? In principle, you take your finite element model with the 
uh, discretization size h, so that's a large model. You have an input, you have an output, you have an initial value, and now you replace it by a small model with an r here for reduced, which looks the same, but the input is the old input, and you have get a new output, and the new dimension should be much smaller, and what you want is that the output error is small, hopefully with small uh, global error bounds, and you want to preserve stability, passivity, conservation laws. And for port Hamiltonian systems in the ODE setting, this was done originally by the work of Bitti and Guetsch in, in 2011, or uh, by uh, Guetsch and Poliuga, uh, uh, Bitti and Wanderschaft. So you do it, this, the usual model reduction Galak in trick, so you write your state, you put it into a finite dimensional subspace VR, and you approximate your Hamiltonian, which in this in the linear case would be Q times X, by uh, <clears throat> a petrov galek in projection of your original matrix Q. And you require biorthogonality. And then if you do that, this gives you a congruence transformation on the J matrix, which keeps it skew symmetric, a congruence transformation on the R matrix, which keeps it semi-definite, and the, the uh, B and uh, this is a more simplified case here without the feed through terms uh, are projected accordingly. If you want to extend this to DAEs, you can do that. Works in principle the same way put X in a subspace, do a Galakian projection, petrov galakian uh, projection for the E and for the Q, and for the J you then would do a Galakian projection. And if V and W are appropriate or normal basis, then the reduced system is again a Port Hamiltonian system. But unfortunately, if you, if you do this, the constraints may not be satisfied. And this is extra work that you have to do um, and if E should be symmetric and positive semi-definite and Q should be the identity, which would be the case in our uh, break squeal model, then you use W equal V. And, and uh, let me skip this. There is a normal form that you can build uh, to see where you can put the, uh, the uh, projections to keep the constraints. There are many, uh, model reduction approaches. Some of them are work, uh, are work in Trier. Uh, so for example, moment matching and uh, effort and flow based methods uh, work done by, by Zara and Nicole. And, and, um, and, but I will talk about POD, proper orthogonal decomposition. And, and Björn is also, Björn's dissertation uh, was on this topic. So we want to apply this to the break. And the idea is here, we go directly to the second order system that we started with, and we just take our eigenvalue problem or, and compute appropriate eigenvectors and put them into a small subspace, Q. It's not the same Q as we had before, it's now a projection Q. And you project the whole quadratic uh, polynomial with this. So the Q has to be chosen that the eigenvalues which create trouble, the squealers, that they should, the eigenvectors to them should be in the space and that should hold for all parameter values. And so how do you do this? You take, you sample your parameter space, you build, you, simulate the model, you put important vectors into a subspace, and you do this for all the parameter values that you've sampled, then you do a singular value decomposition, and you don't do a full, you just compute the large singular values, and you drop everything below a singular value D, and your space Q is just 
that space spent by the leading singular vectors in this space. And with, with this, you project your whole uh, eigenvalue problem. And there's a lot of details that I will skip now, but um, the sampling strategy is important to do it in an adaptive way to find a good solver here to make the singular value decomposition small. But here is an example from an industrial model with 1 million degrees of freedom from a car manufacturer, uh, not too far away from Trier in the capital of the neighboring state. And uh, uh, this is the error in the eigenvalues. So you can see here with about 30 to 40 eigenvalues, I can get this an error of 10 to the minus eight. That's much more than the finite element model has. So with about uh, 20 or 30, um, you can uh, go to, down to the 10 to the minus four, which is probably what you need. And then um, if you use a classical method, which is dropping all the nice skew symmetric and uh, friction terms and then do model reduction, you don't get any reduction. Now, could be the interesting question, how bad is the problem? How, how, when does it happen, this bifurcation? So let's take our Port Hamiltonian model and put a parameter alpha in front of the perturbation term and run this alpha from zero to one. This is another Bavarian uh, car company model. Um, and if you look at the, um, what I plot here is when the, I, the real part of the eigenvalues. So here's a zero. So for alpha equals zero, you are 10 to the minus six. So you're very close to uh, zero to the imaginary axis. And for alpha 0.1, you are already at plus 10 to the minus five. So instability will happen if you don't put enough damping into the system. And the interesting, so there's a master thesis by Andre Beckesch who uh, did the calculations for this and found the bifurcation points by essentially discretizing this parameter interval. And uh, the final part, I want to speak about the stability radius, which is a very nice optimization problem. So question, can we compute the distance to instability? What is that? that is the smallest perturbation to the system which makes the system unstable, putting an eigenvalue on the imaginary axis. So the idea is use model reduction to create a small model and put this inside an optimization loop. And now you optimize, reduce, optimize, reduce, optimize, reduce, and put this into the parameter sampling and do this with the structure. And we implemented a greedy algorithm, which in the original idea was designed for computing computation of an infinity norm. So you complete, compute first a small scale model using a Galaxian projection, so this model reduction. Then you compute the structured stability radius for the small uh, scale radius. You compute the point where the imaginary axis is hit. You add this point to your interpolation set where you try to do the model reduction for tangential model reduction. And then you increase the Galerkin projection space by the new direction and you iterate until convergence. And uh, so we want to know when for a given frequency, the norm of that matrix N is tolerable to preserve the asymptotic stability. And if not, we want to change the damping term with we, we are shims to guarantee this. And so um, you optimize over this norm, two norm or Frobenius norm, such as the spectrum doesn't have a purely imaginary eigenvalue. So that's an eigenvalue optimization uh, code. And here is what we've done with a model, a reduced model of size 10,000, which is one of the models in the hierarchy. And the interesting thing is you can see here um, that around 1100, 
little omega around 1100, you have the smallest distance. And that would be 10 to the 5. And 10 to the 5, you have to divide this by uh, 2 pi. Uh, in the scaling here, that would be the frequency where the, the squeal would happen, could happen. And uh, so we always were able to do this with about a dimension of 72 uh, at most. And the runtime on a, on a laptop was in the order of 100 seconds. OK. This brings me to the end. Let me conclude. What about our wish list? So these Porter Miltonian models are really powerful. They fulfill most of the points on the wish list. We want the representation that is close to physics, it's really encoded into the model. Nice algebraic and geometric and analytical properties, I didn't talk about them. We showed normal forms, it's good for model reduction. And uh, I think these Port Hamiltonian PDAE models are ideal uh, in the sense that our wishes are fulfilled. But there are many things to do in practice, real-time control and optimization many other physical domains, we're working on, on them. Uh, we don't know how to put stochastics in the model in a good way. Where can we allow stochastics? Stability analysis I've talked a little bit about, but you want to do this in the nonlinear setting with Lyapunov exponents. Error estimates, we have some of them, but not many. There's a very interesting thing is that the linear systems that you get from Port Hamiltonian uh, finite element models, they are nice. They have a short recurrence, even though they're non-symmetric. They're data-based realizations. That's an open problem to do this in a good way. And we're currently building software. And we're also putting this into uh, a new digital twin of an uh, of uh, electrical engines like uh, generators in power plants. And with this, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention and my sponsors for their support. And I make a little advertisement. It's partly too late, but uh, we are having currently in Berlin a thematical semester of the, um, of the Einstein uh, Center. And uh, we had already a, a school and a, a thematic conference two weeks ago. And but this is going on the whole semester so please have a look at that and maybe you're interested so mechanical systems will come and and also uh we have a final conference that brings all the different ways of this modeling together so thank you very much yeah thank you volker for this uh, very interesting and uh, somehow comprehensive term when it uh, comes to all these aspects of these ph models are there any questions from the audience? Uh, if so, um, just turn on the microphone and ask. I guess we are not too many people so that this can be handled in this easy way. Yeah, Roland? Yeah. Uh, Volker, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, comprehensive talk. I have a question concerning something you said towards the very end. You mentioned um, that uh, there you get um, you can get short recurrent uh, solvers for uh, these uh, problems. Where can I find more more information on this? Well, I can let me go back for a few slides. Suppose you take such a system here mm -hmm. and you discretize it in time. So this would be the finite element Galactic ODE. And with the properties that we had, that ETQ is QTE, ETQ defines an inner product. Mm -hmm. That's the Hessian of the energy functional. And in this inner product, the discretized model with whatever time discretization method that you use will have mm -hmm. a matrix whose uh, symmetric part 
is positive semi uh, negative ne positive semi definite. Mm -hmm. If you have such a such a matrix, which is arbitrary non symmetric, but the symmetric part is positive semi definite, then you can show that in the appropriate inner product, you have a short recurrence because this matrix this matrix is skew symmetric plus identity in that inner product. Okay. And I was very proud of that result. And I started to write it up, but then I talked with Daniel Shield and he told me Olaf Wittlund, 1974. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's in a paper by Olaf Wittlund from 1974. And there have been some more works about it by Case Voik and also by uh, Ak Xiong Yang from China, which have exploited, but it has never caught on. It's actually every, every um, settled point problem arising in optimization. If you multiply one of the constraints by minus one, the constraint by minus one is in that structure. So you have a short recurrence. But you should not precondition for symmetric positive semi definite or symmetric indefinite. You should precondition for identity plus Q. And if you are interested in this, I can send you a reference. We just finished a paper with Murat Manuoglu uh, on this, it's on the archive uh, to show you that preconditioning like this is really fantastic. Yeah, I'd be very interested. So please, uh, yeah, uh, if I, you have a link, I'll make for a me. note. Mm -hmm. It's on the archive. I mean, this year. Thank you. Yeah. So while Volker is taking this note, uh, maybe yep. somebody else can prepare the next question. Are there any? So maybe I would have one, Volker. I mean, yeah. the applications that you mostly talk about are from technical or physical systems. And that, at least when I listen to your talks, it feels somehow natural in this modern kind of modeling framework. Um, do you know anything uh, outside of this area? So for instance, if, if you consider uh, dynamic systems in economics, I mean, there's yes. also some equilibrium framework behind, not the yes. same physics, but is there anything? Yes, there is. Um, there are some papers by Arjan Wanderschaft who put price models uh, in, in the Port Hamiltonian framework. So you create a cost function, which is semi-convex cost function describing some kind of uh, pricing model or uh, uh, something like that. And uh, there's papers from Ion Chat from, I would say, uh, three or four years ago. You find them on his web, web page. So okay. this is possible. On the other hand, you don't have the physical interpretation and you should think about what is dissipation in an econ economic model. So if there is an interpretation of dissipation, I mean, you can think of different uh, frictions that happen in economic models, but uh, uh, I have not really looked at this uh, in detail, but uh, I am, I once heard him give a talk about it and it was quite interesting that he tried to mimic uh, physics in economic models. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, the friction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Any questions? Uh, yes. Oh, Do you want to go first? Okay. Um, I have a question on these um, general form you had for the differential algebraic equations. Yeah. Uh, there you have these. Uh, E times uh, x dot and and so on, yeah. Um, is there? A, do you know which which kind of variables you write it in? Is this energy variable or a co-energy variable, or is this something different? Or uh, um, this is not a, this is not unique. Okay. So there are different ways to do this, and this also makes it 
um, difficult. We've done this, uh, so uh, Ricardo Morandin has taken the whole hierarchy from the gas transport network and written it in this form. But there are some of these um, components in the, in the hierarchy which are not natural in this form. And then you have a choice of variables and different choices give you different type of models. Mm -hmm. So in particular, the model that you've worked on um, uh, in the paper with, with Herbert, um, that you can write in different ways. It comes naturally in, in the Port Hamiltonian way as, as it was done there, but you can also take a different path. And uh, which one is better, I don't know. So which variables you take as your energy variables. So last week, two, two weeks ago, when we had this workshop on, uh, on energy-based modeling, there were the thermodynamics guys there and the Port Hamiltonian model as there and the gradient flow model as there. And um, there is a guy called uh, Gay Balsam, Francois Gay Balsam. I can send you a reference mm -hmm. who phrased everything in the Port Hamiltonian in the direct structure framework. But this was not so popular with some of the, the thermodynamics guys. So I, I, I think uh, that's a little bit of discussion that needs to be done. <laughs> Whether you use e energy or exergy, for example, uh, that makes a difference. Okay, so Whether you, you, you yeah. have different choices you can write in this form, different choices. Yes, there's different choices, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, there was another question by Christina, if I got this right. Yes, yes. Uh, I was uh, just wondering, uh, do you, uh, are you aware of any approaches where this has been combined with like learning based approaches, especially in the control setting? And what do you think, what would it uh, mean in terms of performance? Um, there are approaches which have combined it with learning. And there are also approaches with, with, which have done it with um, data-based interpolation. But let me, um, let me not accuse anybody, but I wouldn't say it's not, uh, it's not uh, final yet. Let me say it that way. So we've tried realization from data, from pure input output data. And uh, we've tried several approaches and uh, the models that come out of that are lousy. And um, so there's a 2020 paper by Peter Benner and Paul Van Doren and, and others. They did a trick so first do it unstructured, then generate some data, and then use a structured model to find interpolation points and then use these interpolation points to do it again. And then you get a Port Hamiltonian model, but you still get this highly ill conditioning. And concerning the learning, um, the question is what you want to learn. If you want to, for example, we've been using this in the context of um, reactive Navier-Stokes equation, there it would help to uh, learn a turbulence model. So the turbulence modeling. Mm -hmm. and, and so there are many, many people that are currently looking at this. It's a, it's a whole zoo. Eric Karlberg uh, in model reduction. He's now at Amazon. Uh, he's um, uh, looking at it. So it's, it's, it's a hot topic. But I wouldn't say it's uh, it's done yet. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Uh, okay, yeah. um, in Hamiltonian systems, you try to use symplectic integrators. Yes. Do you have a similar thing here in part Hamiltonian system? Yeah, I didn't talk about it. So suppose you wanted to have an integrator which keeps the power balance equation, hmm. a time integrator. It would not be a simple 
symplectic integrator because symplectic integrators not necessarily preserves this inequality. Okay. So, but what you can do is you can use collocation methods mm -hmm. uh, on, and in particular Gauss collocation methods. And you can show that if you have a quadratic Hamiltonian and you use Gauss Legendre collocation methods, then you will preserve this. And in other collocation methods, you will only get, uh, if, if you have a non-quadratic Hamiltonian, you will preserve this up to the discretization error. Mm -hmm. So that is in that um, paper with Ricardo, the 2019 paper, there we showed that Gauss Legendre, it's originally an idea by Paul Kotichka from TU Munich and uh, Laurent Lefebvre from Grenoble. Um, they have done this for the ODE case, but you have to go via the differential geometric approach for this Dirac structure and approximate that, approximate that in a good way. But if you ask me, what should I use? Implicit midpoint rule. Okay, this is also this is a, this is also yes, it's also symplectic, <laughs> but this does the job here. Okay, good. Thank and you. there's there's higher order um, Gauss Legendre collocation method, but implicit midpoint rule is the simplest method that you can use, and you will get all the properties also that what I talked about with Roland that comes out okay. automatically. Okay, great. Anything else? more questions? Well, if this is not the case, uh, then Volker, thank you again for your time and the talk and uh, the answers to these many questions. And yes, I hope uh, the next time we invite you, you are again able to really come to Trier. Um, but uh, it was nice that you made this possible via Zoom. Thank you. You're welcome.